sanctions have had an effect, we, we can conclude that, and that comes into play with this exchange rate and the hyperinflation. However, sanctions historically are quite counterproductive in the sense that if you impose sanctions on your enemy, it tends to strengthen your enemy. And, and that's why we've seen Castro and the communists hanging around for so long in Cuba, is, is the American sanctions. But there, there's a, a, a whole history of sanctions, and, and they're usually counterproductive and failures. The, one, the ones that they're trying to squeeze even harder in Iran are, are not only, I think, probably going to end up being counterproductive, but will be dangerous potentially in the sense that if you squeeze and squeeze and, and you, you don't allow the Iranians to sell hardly any oil, then what do they have to lose by shutting the Strait of Hormuz down? And if they do that, that's 35 percent of all the world's oil uh, comes from through the Strait and 20 percent of the liquefied natural gas in the world. Now, now that, if they shut that for even a week, the Straits, it would be bigger than any bomb you can even conceive of. We're actually hearing about quite severe layoffs of 600 to 800,000 Iranians in the last year because the state-run organizations uh, are not competing at the world stage. There isn't a market outside of Iran for what they're producing. That's what you're hearing as well. It's, it's what I'm hearing, and, and, and you do have the sanctions coming in and doing some biting here because re, some replacement parts and things like that, particularly in the, they have a fairly large automobile sector, and, and, and that has been, uh, shall we say, uh, plugged up uh, due, due to the sanctions. So. It's not only the, the internal mismanagement and, and the lack of competitiveness, but at, at the margin, you can say, well, sanctions are working. But, but, as I said before, sanctions are counterproductive in the sense that if the, if the Iranians feel they've lost their job because of sanctions, then the Iranians point their finger at, at the, those who are imposing the sanctions and say they're, they're the enemy, they're, they're the bad guys, they're, they're the guy who really caused me to lose my job. You served as an advisor to different governments in the past, most notably Indonesia. Iran has a lot of potential. It's just not realizing the potential because it's so isolated. This is an economy that could be uh, an emerging market or developing market powerhouse. Well, uh, Iran could be, but you, you really have to go back to the days of the Shah. And, and remember, in the ramp up to the 79 revolution, the, the Shah had made a, I, I refer to him really at the end, he was a Soviet Shah. He, he was enamored with Soviet planning. They, they collectivized uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, some uh, agricultural land. The, some of the peasants were very upset about that. It wasn't working very well. He had these delusions about m mega projects that, that, that of course, that never worked. Uh, and, and you had, you know, the, the five-year plan, the seven-year plan, and, and all these things. So you had a, a heightened level of government intervention and uh, basically making a mess out of the economy in Iran going into the revolution and then it's just simply been endemic ever since and and as a result I, I calculate what I call a misery index and and without without going through all the details of the index you find that the misery index which deals with unemployment inflation growth interest rates you add all, all of those things together and you get a misery index it's it's been about uh, since 1991, about twice as high in Iran as it even was in Egypt at the height of the Arab Spring. So, so in relative terms, the, the, the mismanagement in Iran is, is just phenomenal, even on, on, shall we say, kind of a regional basis. So you're exactly right. I mean, if, if, they, if they would ever unwind the state and, and unwind the priesthood and get it out of the economy, the, the place would boom.